Session four is a truthful church in a confused world. A truthful church in a confused world. So we've been talking about the gospel, right? And the gospel makes some pretty significant claims on the world, right? The gospel is not just a set of abstract ideas that have no effect on real life. If you believe the gospel, you believe some concrete ideas, right? Namely, Jesus Christ was a man, a real person, who lived 2,000 years ago, walked on this earth. He claimed miraculous things, and through his death and then subsequent resurrection, vindicated those claims, and hopefully, if you're a believer, uh, you believe that he was who he said he was. He's the Son of God. So those, those are truths, right? Uh, so when we talk about the gospel, we're dealing with truth. So if you, if you will think with me, um, i got to turn this off. If you, oh, sh- sh- hush, okay. If you will think with me about our culture, we're, not, we're in a strange age for truth, okay? Truth is under a difficult set of attacks in our culture and in our day, and truth is not really a popular thing when it disagrees with other sets of truth, right? So in a, in a way, our culture is all about truth, your truth, my truth, uh, but also it has a problem with truth. And as Christians and as a church, um, if we're here just to hang out, um, if we're here to, you know, break bread together sometimes, sing some songs together. <clears throat> some of you might really enjoy that, but I'm sorry. Me, personally, I could find other places to sing songs and hang out with people. Um, this is not what church is about for me. It shouldn't be what church is about for the Christian. We're here because we believe things. I believe that God is real. He is who he says he is. I believe he was perfectly re- revealed in the Son, Jesus Christ. And so I believe subsequently that his apostles were authoritative that, and their teachings about the church is authoritative, and that is why I am here. I believe in him. I believe in this church. And these are real life-affecting, life-changing truths, okay? Where our culture has gone on a journey with truth. I want to kind of map this for you a little bit, give you a brief history lesson. Um, just kind of a, a timeline of truth in Western culture. And y'all know what I mean when I say Western culture, right? You mean, I mean the West, you know, West of the Middle East. So the European and North American culture. So we have, um, maybe some of you are, are history people and you know some of this already. Some of you might not know this. That hopefully this will be helpful. Uh, but let's kind of go through a timeline of where we are right now with truth in our modern day. So first of all... <clears throat> You have the advent, the appearing of what they call the modern era. Okay, so the modern era is sometimes dated between the late 1700s and the early 1800s. And what you have in the modern era is the rise of what we call modern science, uh, which had Christian roots, right, in Europe. Uh, All the early scientists were Christians. Uh, They studied the natural order because they assumed that if God's real, there will be natural laws, natural orders to things when we study them. That's why they studied the heavens. That's why they studied under microscopes. That's why they performed science. So Christianity gives birth to Western science, okay? But once science rises, there's such a fascination with all the things we're learning because of this thing we call science, this study of the natural order. We're learning all kinds of things, right, at a rapid pace. We learn that the uh, universe works a little differently than we thought. Uh, The sun is at the center, and we have a galaxy, and there's other galaxies, and there's different uh, planets and all these different things we've learned from observing the natural order. So you have the rise of science. Well, with this fascination with science... You have an obsession with, in the, in the beginning of the, the late 1700s, early 1800s, <clears throat> you have an obsession with reason. So the only reason that science is doable, y'all know this, is because we're rational creatures. You get that? So you can take two apples and go one apple plus another apple equals two apples. You know, <laughs> So you're rational. You can understand that, right? You can't teach a dog... 
you know, well, maybe some dogs you can, but they can't conceptualize one plus one equals two. But you're rational. You can understand that. So we used reason to understand the world through science, and that led to a movement called the Enlightenment. It was this period of time. It mostly happened in France, and if you've heard of the French Revolution, it was a pretty bloody time, actually. Um, but the, there was this idea that as man seems to be progressing and understanding the natural world better and better, we can use reason to accomplish these things, and now human beings seem to be, we're no longer in the dark ages, we're beginning to enlighten ourselves. We're beginning to, to mature and wake up to the world around us. So if I tried to give you a statement, this is what the modern era kind of thought or encapsulated. We don't need God for truth, okay? So the European elites started to reject their heritage as Christians and say we don't need, a God, we don't need the Christian Judeo God to tell us what is true now. We, can use, we only need reason and human wisdom. So if we have reason and the scientific method and human wisdom, just rationalism, then we can make our way through this world on our own. We don't need God. And this was the French Revolution. Uh, it had a little bit of influence in some people in our country, uh, like Thomas Jefferson and um, the Paine guy. I can't remember his first name. Uh, Thomas Paine, they were, they were deists, okay? So they believe, well, there has to be some type of God that kind of started everything, but he's not the Christian God. He's just this really big being that kind of just started the world like a, like a top or like a watch. He's the watchmaker God, and then he kind of just left us alone. And if we use reason and human intellect and human education, then we can solve the problems that we need for truth, okay? So that's the modern era. Late 1700s, early 1800s. Well, then you have, out of that, you have what we call the postmodern era. Now, that runs from about the end of the 1800s into about the 1970s, 80s, 90s. People argue about when it kind of drops off. Most of you all, pretty much except some over here, most everybody was born, along with me, in what you could call the postmodern era. So the postmodern era... Uh, because we, we went away from God and we put this emphasis on science and reason and human enlightenment, what it led us to was what we call subjectivism, which means that truth is subjective. Individualism and personal truth. Well, if every human being is rational and if every human being has the ability, if we have the ability to discern truth for ourselves apart from God... Well, then, who are you to tell me what's true? What if that's true? How many of you uh, heard this back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s? Well, that's, that's true for you. That's good for you, right? We were raised kind of in that era. Uh, that's true for you. It can be, something can be true. Your personal faith can be true for you behind closed doors, but I don't believe in God, so my truth is fine for me. Or whatever truth. Well, what this gave birth to was, if I had to put it in a phrase, it would be this. If truth can be decided on our own, then everyone can decide their own truth. We can all decide what is true for us, what works for me and what works for you. Well, you might think that we still live in that era. Uh, and there's still a little bit of that around in some of the older generations. But we're actually leaving that era and moving into a new era in the West. And I've tried to coin it. Other people call it different things. This is my best attempt. We'll call it the neo-pagan era. Or the neo just means new. The new pagan era. So what we have now in today's world is the return of universal truths. Truths, plural. And the war for power. So if you notice, if y'all watch the news... If you're around secular people, we're not in the era anymore where everyone says, well, can't that just be your truth as a Christian? And I'll have my own truth, and we'll just all do our own thing, and let's just get along. We don't live in that world anymore. That's the 1980s and 1990s. We live now in a world where people are insisting, my truth is the truth. So with the loss of Christianity and theism in general... 
we have devolved into a world where everybody gets to decide their own truth. And now, not only do we get to decide, but we're going to fight to see who wins. Who wins? So, you want some illustrations of this? Now we live in a culture where not like in the 90s, you know, I think that I am a homosexual and I want to exist in a homosexual relationship. You do what you want to do. You can be heterosexual and a Christian. That's fine. I'll do what I want to do. We'll all just get along. We don't live in that world anymore. Now we live in a culture where if I say I am a woman, I'm going to fight to force you to admit verbally that I am a woman. And if you don't consent and call me by my pronouns and respect me properly, then you are actually doing violence to me by not seeing things the way my truth sees it. And what this really is, is this, is a, this isn't new, guys. This is a reemergence of ancient paganism. The Romans were the same way. Everyone fought for who was right, right? In Rome, power, might equals right in pagan Rome. Whoever was the strongest could raise the strongest army, became Caesar. That's how it worked. And the pagans forced their belief systems onto other cultures that they conquered. And in Rome, you could pretty much, if you were wealthy enough and powerful enough, you could decide your own truth. Uh, the Roman Caesars, many of them were way more than homosexual. They were a bunch of things. They, they were sexual deviants in a, a thousand different ways. Um, Rome was a, a very... A culture of paganism. They had a, a different God for everything. And we're really re-entering that time period. And we're going to start, we've started fighting over who's going to win this war of truth. What is true? Well, if I say I'm a woman, that is true and you have to go with it. Or if a woman says she's a man, you have to call her a man. And we're entering this neo-pagan era of truth. So we're back to universal truths. Have you noticed that? It's not subjective. It is universal. They are asserting that I am a woman and everyone around me must see me that way. That is a universal truth. So it's not private truth anymore. It's a universal truth. Everyone around me must bend to my pronouns or whatever that I insist that I am. So this is this journey. See, see how truth has, has ebbed and flowed through our uh, culture Hello, friends. How are y'all? <laughs> so we, this is the journey we have been on as a Western culture, from modern to postmodern to neo-pagan. So truth is a hot-button issue in today's culture. So the question comes back to the Christian. If all of that is going on in the world around us, where does that put you? Where does that put us as a church? As believers, if we claim to be Christians, we believe in Christ, then where does this put us in a neo-pagan world? Well, I think it brings us back, what did you say? In yeah, in the minority. We're going to have to get used to being a minority people group, which is new for us. It also puts us in the cross eras, right? But if you think about it, we have to come back to and reemphasize and focus on what do we as Christians believe is truth? This is the most important question you can ask yourself. It's what Pilate asked Jesus, right? Uh, he said, what is truth? He just said that even back in that day, they were asking, well, what is truth? We're asking that same question here again today. So what is truth? Let's look at a few things. For, for something to be true, I tried to give it a definition. We can go really deep into this and get philosophical. We're going to try and not do that. We're going to try and keep it simple. When I say truth, I'm talking about universal, objective reality, okay? What is truth? What does it look like? Well, first of all, I think truth is transcendent, okay? Truth, if, it's, if something is true, objectively, universally true, then it transcends, it goes above, that's what that word means, it transcends all cultures, all places. We believe in transcendent truth, don't we, as Christians? Let me give you an example I believe it is wrong to murder another human being anywhere on the whole planet at any time, in any scenario. 
If they are innocent, it is wrong for one, Christians believe it is wrong for one human being to take the life of another human being, right? Okay? That is a transcendent universal truth. Something else. Truth has to be independent. If truth is contingent, meaning it depends on something else, then it's not truth. Truth has to, the source of all truth must be independent from the things that it affects, if that makes sense. Uh, not only is it independent, it's universal. We've already mentioned this. It applies at all places at all times. And then lastly, because it is true, if something is transcendent, independent, universal, it is therefore what? It's authoritative. If it is true that it is wrong to murder an innocent person, then what does that mean about murder? We don't need to do it. And we need to punish the person who tries to do it. That is a universal truth. It is authoritative. It teaches us how to live. So we're going to look at some two different sections of Scripture tonight. We're going to look in John, and we're going to look in Ephesians, okay? So let's start with John. Jesus has a lot to say about truth, doesn't he? So one of his most famous lines is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That is a huge claim. Do you get that? That is a massive claim. No one else has ever made a claim that crazy. He's either insane or he is true. He is Lord. And, and we're going to unpack some of his other statements. Let's look in John 1 verse 3. John is describing Jesus. He says, all things were made through him, Jesus. And without him was not anything made that was made. Where's that? There's you some transcendence, some independence, right? He's claiming that Jesus was the very creative agent in the creation of the cosmos itself. That is a universal truth. That, transcend, that means that Jesus and God is outside of his creation and independent of it. It's not, we didn't create Jesus, right? He created us. He's independent, transcendent. And then he also says a little bit further down at verse 14, and the word, who's, he, who's the word? Jesus. John is using that as uh, indicative of Jesus. And the word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So that's what we're talking about tonight. So I think a better question is not what is truth, but what you should be asking as a Christian is who? Who is truth? Truth is not a thing. Truth is not an idea. Truth is a person. It's Jesus Christ. He claims to be the truth. So when people ask you what is truth, really you should say, well, I would phrase it differently. I would say who is truth? Who reveals ultimate truth to us? And as a Christian, we believe it was Jesus Christ. He is the truth. Truth is not an abstract set of ideas that we, that we you know, uh, set out in front of us and try and discover and map and understand. Truth is a person who revealed himself to us for us to understand. What does he say in John 8, 12? I, Jesus is talking here, I am the light of the what? Of Palestine? Uh, uh, yes, of the world, universal. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Is that not a, a miraculous and amazing promise? And those of you that have trusted him, you can almost get teary-eyed at this statement because you know that he, he's come through on this promise to you, hasn't he? For the Christian, he is our light, amen? The light of life itself. Who would we be without Jesus? Who would you be without Jesus, Christian? Who would I be? What we see here is Jesus is claiming universal transcendent truth, and he's saying, look, you can bank on me. I am trustworthy. I am the good shepherd. If you follow me, you will never hunger or thirst and I will carry all your heavy burdens. Jesus' yoke is easy and light, right? 
So we know that Jesus is truth. He is the source of truth for the Christian, and he is a trustworthy source of truth. So you say, well, Matt, I agree with all that. That sounds great. Where does this leave us? we got the world over here creating their own new universal truth. We've got Christians who believe in the transcendent you know, universal truth of Jesus Christ. Where does this leave us? Well, not to discourage you, but I think the best way I can say it is a truth war. <laughs> I know we don't like war, uh, but there are some truth wars. This sets us at odds with the culture around us. Uh, maybe about 20 or 30 years ago, that would be hard to see. Maybe 50 years ago. Could you all agree with that? It's kind of, well, you know, the world out there, they do some drinking and, and dancing and gambling every now and then that we don't like. But for the most part, most Americans seemed pretty Christianized in the 1940s and 50s, right? Well, we don't live in that day and age anymore. Uh, God has changed things by his judgment and his providence. And we live in a culture now where it's pretty clear that the world does not like what we believe. And we disagree with what the world believes. So this kind of pits us against one another. How do we make sense of this truth war? Because at the end of the day, as I said up here, following Jesus leads to conflict. I don't want to discourage you, but we don't live in a culture anymore where you can slide by and just you know, live the good old American dream and not really ever have to stand up for what you believe or ever even maybe be opposed for what you believe. Uh, Many of you, most on this side of the room, are in the, are in the second half of the, the, of the game. So, you, not to discourage you, but you, you will... <laughs> Pat's going, what? <laughs> so, you most likely will have less of these battles on the horizon than some of us that are a little younger and way younger, some of those. Um, but we are entering an era where there seems to be more and more of a clear line between the Christian view of the world and the pagan view of the world. So I want to give you, I didn't know younger people were going to be in here tonight, but um, I want to give you an example of this conflict. So uh, we're going to use the Western world over here, and we're going to pit it against the Christian world, okay? So this is the pagan world we live in, and over here we're going to put the Christian world. I'm just going to give one example, and it's because it's the hottest topic in our culture probably right now. We're going to talk about sexuality, okay? So... Pagan sexuality, secular sexuality, looks like this. It says, sexual fulfillment is to be pursued at all costs, right? At all costs. Even if you have to have your body mutilated to turn you into a different version of a gender. Whatever you got to do to pursue sexual fulfillment, that's the ultimate goal of pagan sexuality. What does it also say? Sex is basically meaningless if it's done for enjoyment's sake, right? It's the pagan view. It's just sex. Like, let everybody just have fun and do what they want. Who cares? As long as they're both consenting adults and it's just for enjoyment, that's, that's it. That's the pagan view, right? Also, it says that true love does exist, but it's something that you feel, right? You'll just feel right when you're with the right person. It, it just, you'll just feel it, you know? Well, this is very popular. Anybody seen movies, TVs, books, everything, paint this as what's the norm? Yeah, this is the norm in our world. Well, what's the Christian view? What does the quick Christian view say? The Christian view of sexuality is this. Christian sexuality, number one, if my button works. Sex is beautiful, according to God, and precious, and designed to be enjoyed inside a committed covenant union of a man and a woman. Now, 50, 100 years ago, nobody would have batted an eye at that statement. That sounds great, you know, wonderful. But nowadays, you can get canceled and hurt <laughs> for saying something that radical, that we believe sex exists inside this beautiful union of commitment and covenant between a man and a woman. What else is, do the Christians believe? Sex is not meaningless. Sex is meaningful because it reflects the gospel and it teaches that commitment, sacrificial service, and love are the marks of true humanity. That's the Christian vision for sex. It's an allegory of God's love itself for us. Therefore, we, we follow his lead on how it is to be done. And then last but not least, true love is more than a feeling. 
Now, that, more than a feeling. Sorry, that just came to my head. I hope, I hope as a Christian, you, you, have come, you have discovered this truth. I hope you're not still stuck in a pagan version of love. But those of you that have been married for more than a year, <laughs> two, three years, you know that true love is more than a feeling. She said, yeah. <laughs> You, if, you, if you bank on waking up and feeling the oozy goozies every morning and that's what's going to keep you together, that ain't going to cut it. That's not how marriage works. But that's not how love works, is it? The Christian vision of true love is commitment, right? Dedication, self-service to another, even when they hurt you, even when they do you wrong. That's the vision of true love. It is what humanity is, what Jesus revealed humanity to truly be to us. So this is just an example of how our culture, and we could list a thousand other things, could we not? Uh, we, we are in a world where truths are colliding. So, how do we live in truth as Christians? I want to look at one main section of Scripture with you. Uh, Paul, we really could do a whole study of this book. But in Ephesians uh, 4, Paul's writing this book to the church at Ephesus. So what we are a what? A church, right? Everybody agree with that? Thumbs up? We're a church. So you could imagine Paul writing this letter directly to Emmanuel, okay? That's the context. He's writing to a group of people he knows that he's trying to lead, and he's trying to offer some correction and some guidance. Well, he has a lot to say in Ephesians, okay? We could spend literally a year or more studying Ephesians. But I want to take some highlights out of this epistle. Because one of the things he deals with in the middle of this epistle is unity in the church, which we've already talked about. But inside of his discussion on unity, he has some things to say about truth. And how Christians, having the truth, which is Jesus, how are we supposed to act with that truth? Are we supposed to hop on Twitter and you know, light everybody up that disagrees with us? Are we supposed to put billboards in our front yard that say a curse word uh, and then it's followed by the, the elected official we don't like, which I have passed Christian houses with that in their front yard. I'm like, what? Uh, no. Uh, how are we supposed to handle truth? What's our demeanor? How are we supposed to function in a world that disagrees with us? So let's look at a few different things. Let's look at Ephesians 14 through 16 and then verse 25. All right, I'm going to read it for you on the screen. <clears throat> so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. So he doesn't want them to be easily swayed and taken away by all these different other types of ideas. Rather, what's this next phrase? Speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. Who is the head? Christ. Into Christ. From whom the whole body, he uses that word, body, the whole body, talking about the church, is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow. That's a huge word. Grow so that it builds itself up. Does it stop there? Builds itself up in love. So we have, a, we have a goal here, right? We want to build up, but not just build up in just general knowledge. Build up in just general truth or ideas. What does it say? Build up in love. And then at the end he says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, there's an important word, let each one of you speak. He's talking to a church. Pretend he's saying this to you. Let each one of you, Emmanuel, speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So there's a lot here. He's given us some correction, some teaching on how to live in light of the truth of Jesus and the gospel and how to live inside of a church with that truth. Okay, so he starts with, he doesn't want us to be like children anymore. What are children like? Fickle, perfect word. Children are fickle. 
Children can be into one thing here today and something else tomorrow. They can be convinced they're going to live in a castle on an island, and then two days later they're shipbuilders. You know, children are just all over the place, right? Children are fickle, easily deceived, easily swayed. He doesn't want us to be like children. You get that? He wants us to not be tossed to and fro but he want, and carried about by all these winds of doctrine. Another word you could say for doctrine is what? Truth. Doctrines are truths. That's what it is. He does not want us to be easily taken away and captive by all these other truths in this pagan culture around us. We live more similar to the Ephesians today than all of history. They lived in a very pagan culture, and now we're back in a pagan culture. So we got a lot in common with these folks. There's a lot of truth floating around in the air, isn't there? Anybody turned on Fox News or CNN lately? There's all these different brands of truth. You can get the flaming conservative brand, the flaming liberal brand, and everything in between. And truth is everywhere, and it's after your brain, right? It wants you. He doesn't want us to be caught in all these different truths. Rather, speaking the truth in love. So he is saying there is one truth, actual truth, transcendent truth. It's the gospel. It is Jesus. Speaking what is true about Christ in love, we are to grow up, grow up, okay, in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So let's unpack these. Look, we could literally preach a whole series on just what we've highlighted. So we're not going to do that. I'm going to try and draw four things out that we can talk about in our discussion, discussion groups, and then we're done. So let's look, first of all, four things about, from this text. I think the first one that's important to note is life in Christ is the goal of truth. What does he say? We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So what's the goal of us growing here at Emmanuel? Are we just trying to assimilate more Bible knowledge? Are we trying to be smarter than the pagan culture around us? Are we trying to fight them and win them in debates? Or what's the point? Well, no, we're trying to grow up into Jesus. That's the goal. We want to grow up and be like Jesus. And we're here to help one another do that. Okay? Our goal, life in Christ is the goal of truth. He doesn't just tell you who he is and just so you have the information. He wants to transform you into his own image. Right? He's redeeming us from our sinful state into our sanctified state. So that's number one. Life in Christ is the goal of truth. Number two. This life, the life in Christ, this life forms in the community of Christ. So the life of Christ forms inside the community of Christ. What is the community of Christ? The church. We could park here for a while. But one of the biggest disservices we've done to ourselves since the 80s and 90s and the rise of the mega church and all this different stuff, televangelists and all that, is we have created an American Christian, Christian culture where everyone's on an island to themselves. I'm going to tell you something that's going to hurt you. One of the worst things that they sold us in the 80s and 90s till today is that the means of grace in your life, the way you grow as a believer, is everybody gets alone and reads their Bible and prays. Now some of you went, oh! I re I'm not saying it's bad to read your Bible and pray. But does the Bible have a section where it says, get alone every day and read your Bible and pray to grow? No. What are the means of grace taught in the Bible? Gathering with the saints. Worshiping with the saints. Hearing the word preached with the saints. Observing the ordinances, baptism, Lord's Supper, with the saints. Loving the saints. Being loved by the saints. The main way we grow as Christians is right here. This is the nucleus of God's battle plan to change us into his image. Now, should you read your Bible and pray? Yes, of course. But is that the nucleus of the Christian life, what you get alone in your, in your secret little huddle? 
just you and Jesus. He gives it all to you. No, we're, we're, a, we're a hive. Y'all get that? We're a beehive. We're not independent islands. I need, when I read something, to ask you, well, what do you think this means, you know? And you need to ask him and her, and we need to talk, and, and we are a hive. We work together, okay? We're a community, the community of truth. So what does he say? From whom the whole, what's that word? Body, talking about the church. The whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. That's an important word. What does equipped imply? If the church is equipped, what does that mean? What? It's prepared. If something is prepared or equipped, what had to happen? Maturity. Someone had to equip them, right? You don't equip yourself. You know, you're giving equipment, right? Well, right before this verse, he explains that God has given to the church all the equipment it needs to equip itself. He lists uh, prophets, apostles, teachers, pastors, shepherds, deacons, all these things, they are the gifts that Christ has given to equip us into the work of ministry. And it keeps going, which is equipped when each part is working properly. It makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Can you see how this clearly teaches that the way we grow individually is corporate? Now, I'm not trying to harp on you about coming to church, you know, like, oh, you know, where are you working? Because half our people are gone tonight because they're sick. You know, I'm not trying to say you need to come to church more, but I'm trying to say you need to come to church more. That's why I'm trying, you know, not because, not because we, not because it's important that there's bodies in the pews, but it's because I need you and you need me. And y'all need them. And y'all need them. We need one another to grow. Churches grow Christians, right? Christians don't grow themselves on their own. We are a hive, okay? We are a colony. We are communal. We are not individualistic. So that's number two. Let's look at number three. Christian truth is corrective. Now, this goes without saying. Truth in general is corrective. What if I, I, what if I said, Fire! I saw some people falling asleep. No, what if I screamed fire and there was actually a fire in the corner? What would happen? Everyone would hopefully leave, unless you're an idiot, right? Everyone would leave because that is something that is true, right? And if it's true, it affects you. And it's the same with the gospel. Truth is corrective. It corrects us. This is the part we don't like to talk about always, but what does he say? Therefore, what's that next phrase? Having put away falsehood. you got to think about that. What's he calling us to do as a church? We're to work on, as he says in Romans, the renewing of our minds. Look, we live and swim in a pagan culture all week long, right? Who works in the secular workforce? Okay, a big chunk, probably 50% in the room. Well, you are surrounded by and exposed to the pagan culture nonstop. Who has TVs in their house? Everyone, okay? That's a giant 72-inch square that's piping in pagan culture into your eyes and ears. I'm not saying they're bad. Like, you, you should have the discernment to be able to filter that. But I'm saying we are exposed to this all the time. So we have to work with one another to put away falsehood. To see what is true about Christ, what is true in Scripture as Christians, and put away the things that are false. We have to strive as a body to put away falsehood. So truth is corrective. Now, some of you, some of you might have uh, liked that part, that, you know, because you like some. Some people are attracted. I hear a doodad. Is that some Pat? Is that you? <laughs> I hear it somewhere. Somebody's getting a call. It's okay. All right, so. So, <laughs> let's all dance to the duty. All right. So some of us love the fact that truth is corrective, okay? Now, some of you are shy. 
So you don't, you're not big on confrontation. So you don't, you don't like that half, that truth is corrective, right? You don't like talking about your faith. You don't like opposing people. But some of you love the fact that truth is corrective because you're really good at that. I love cutting a, a liberal's head off at work. Or I love uh, uh, cutting a conservative down to size. I love putting so-and-so in their place. I love putting, you know, correcting what... We're, some people are bent towards the fact that, yeah, truth is corrective. I'm a Christian. I've got all these reasons that you're bad and I'm good and you're wrong and I'm right. Okay? But we don't like the second half of how we're to handle truth. What is number four? Correction is to be done correctly. There's a way we correct. He didn't just say, build each other in truth, right? Let's look at what he said. Rather, what's this phrase? We say this all the time, but it's something we lose sight of so often. Speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, which is Christ. So there's this idea of truth and love here. What, what does this mean? Don't answer, just think. What does this mean? We say this so much as Christians. Speaking the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. We say it so much, I think we forget, what does that look like? What does it mean? Like, does that mean you correct a person who you disagree with, but you smile while you do it? I think you're an idiot, you know? Is that speaking the truth in love? Are you supposed to say it in a really nice voice, and that makes it loving? What does that look like? Well, again, we could spend months probably fleshing out how the New Testament teaches us to do this, but we're going to try and condense these two words, okay? Truth and love. Let's start with truth. It's important to remember what we're talking about. When I say truth, we're talking about gospel truth, okay? Not personal truth. We're talking about things that flow from the gospel. We're not talking about your personal opinions on economics or uh, your personal opinions on how so and so, how your grandchild cut their hair this week or something. Like, those are things we like to fight about, but those aren't the things I'm talking about when I'm saying truth. We're talking about gospel truth. We're talking about Jesus, the gospel, the Bible, things like that. We're not talking about personal opinions. All truth, this is important, concerning Jesus flows from Scripture. So, if you're hearing this and you're thinking, I got somebody in the church who did me wrong or who said something that I disagree with or I have a friend that said something, I need to go confront them, right? Well, you need to ask yourself, is the truth you're thinking about, does it come from Scripture? Because all the stuff we know about Jesus that is authoritative comes from Scripture, amen? So we're talking about scriptural issues. Did you know that narrows down what a church should fight about by a lot? You know, there's a lot of things we should learn to get along about that we disagree about that are not laid out in Scripture. We get that? Scripture says nothing about what color the walls are. So if most of the church wants blue but you want red, just find a way to get over it. It's not that important. That's not what I'm talking about with truth. You go, I'm going to go confront them because they wanted blue. You know, it's clear that it should be red. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not those type things. We're talking about scriptural things. When you see a believer or you personally are struggling with something that's against God's word, we want to lovingly come along that person and find a way to lead that person into truth, restore that person, and then hopefully restore you someday. And lastly, truth brings life to the individual. I want you to think about that. If you're a truth bringer, if it's actually true, the goal is to bring life to this person. Okay? If you hate this person because they're just different than you and you just want to correct them, that's the wrong motive. That's not the type of truth I'm talking about. If you are work, working with someone and let's say they're openly homosexual and they're flamboyantly dressed and they talk different than you do and they act different than you do, I'm not talking about you think they're disgusting so you're going to find a way to drop jabs about how they should actually be. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you want to see life come to that person. You want to see that person brought to Jesus. You want to see that person restored and renewed to a full and healthy life in Christ. So that's the type of truth we're talking about. So what about love? 
I think there's many things we can say about love, but a simple synopsis is if you're going to do truth in love, it's at least going to be these things. All right? I cannot sit up here and explain to you exactly how to do this. I wish I could. I know some of you that work in the secular workforce, or you're hoping, Matt, tell me exactly what to say to my lost coworker. I wish I could. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I can't. But I can give you some basic guidelines of how it should look. Okay? So when we deal with truth, this, this is how we should do it in love. First of all, kind. It can be kind. If it's vindictive and sinister and, and mean-spirited, no one's going to listen to you. Has, have you ever convinced anyone by being mean to them? Just cruel to them? Does that ever win an argument? Spouses, does that ever win an argument? No. Meanness does nothing. Venom does nothing. Okay? It can at least be kind. Patient. Okay? Was Christ grumpy and short-tempered with you? No. He lets you live your life. He still lets you sin and break his law every day. He lets you without killing you, without, without striking you dead. He lets you, before you were a Christian, live a life of open defiance of him. What was he? He was patient. If Christ can show us a patience far beyond your ability to understand because you're not all-knowing like him, he knows right down into your soul if he can show us that patience, then we can show those we disagree with patience. Okay? Thirdly, gracious. Okay? Gracious. This kind of goes with patience. How many of you have dealt with lost people? And I, if you had like one conversation and they just converted right in front of you, you're right. I want to be a Christian. Those are rare. I, I've never had that happen. Maybe some of you have. What's the norm, though? Conversation. After conversation, after conversation, after conversation, after prayer, after conversation, after prayer, after prayer, after conversation, after coffee date, after dinner date, like prayer, prayer. I mean, it's like, it's this long process, right? We have to be patient and gracious. Look, you don't have to correct somebody you disagree with, Christian or non-Christian, every time they say something you don't like. Did you know you can show them grace by shutting your mouth? And just choosing this time, I'm going to let them slide with that. Is that not how God has done, treated you? Has God come down and pointed his finger in your nose every time you've done something he didn't like? No. He has graciously allowed you in your ignorance to grow in knowledge of him. Because he's gracious. We can learn to be that way too. Let's start with the major things with people we disagree with, and let's overlook the minor things. Let's let it slide sometimes, okay? Now, I'm not saying let it slide forever, right? There's some wisdom here between grace and truth. You can't just be all grace and never, ever say or do anything. You have to be winsome and trust in the Spirit to find the right ways to bring up the right things, okay? It's a good book called Theological Triage. I suggest you read it. It's real thin. Y'all know what triage is? You know, they decide, they rank what's important. If Robert comes in with a broke toe, but Keith's bleeding out, what are they going to do in triage? Robert, please have a seat. Keith, this way. You know, <laughs> because Keith's going to die if they don't get him strapped up. Robert will be fine. He just broke a toe. That's triage. Well, we need to learn as Christians to do some theological triage. Okay, if they're an unbeliever, you shouldn't be worried about uh, the way they dress and talk and think politically. That should be way down on the list. Okay? The major thing is their soul is dead because they, they haven't believed in the gospel of Christ. Let's start there. We'll work on the other stuff later. But Christians are the worst at this, right? We're just so bad at this. Like, we can't stand, we have this problem of not liking people that disagree with us. And that's really a human thing, right? That's when we're being more like the world than separate from the world. So, kind, patient, gracious humble. This is huge. Can I give you a news bulletin? You don't know everything. I don't know everything. Big, giant, flashing sign. Took me forever to learn, okay? I still haven't learned it, but you don't know everything. You don't. There are things about God you don't know yet. There are things about His Word you haven't learned yet. There are things about the Christian life you don't know yet. Take a posture of humility when you're talking with a brother or sister in Christ. They might know something you don't know. 
Don't, don't think yourself better than them because you think you might be more educated than them or wiser than them. Take a posture of humility when you approach people with differences. So that's just an idea. That brings us to our conclusion. To wrap it all up, the truth of Christ puts us at odds with the culture. That's just the truth. We're going to be at odds with the culture. But the more that the truth and love of Christ shines from the church, the less attractive the world's truths, plural, and loves will be. Now, I want you to think about that. That is so important to keep in mind. The pagan Roman world, completely pagan, violently ancient, they butchered one another, was the very hostile place to differ with people. What happened in the ancient Roman world within 300 years of the death of Christ? It Christianized. It took a thousand years to collapse. It Christianized. Within 300 years, Christianity was the dominant religion in pagan Rome. Can you think about that? And that was a culture where they threw a spear through your chest if they disagreed with you, you know? And you think that we're the weak, anemic losers? Look, if our culture's paganizing, those are the environments that Christianity blossoms inside of. But there has to be a difference between us and the world. There has to be the shining church, which when, we, when, the, when the world sees healthy, loving marriages with healthy, loving parent and child relationships, with healthy, loving church community, they're going to look at that and go, you know, something's, something's attractive about that. That's different than the way I was raised. So I hope that you think about this, pray about this, when we go and discuss together a truthful church in a confused world. It's a heavy calling, right? So It's a lot, I know that, but Christ is going to get us through it. And it's something we need to think about and talk about.